in Motor Week this week, probably the most difficult choice of all, a BMW or a Mercedes. The all-plastic car from Chrysler. But first, Mike Rutherford puts his feet up. Well, we all know about Kia of Korea. They've had some terrible financial problems lately. It seems the Korean government have bailed them out and have given them a financial hand. It would be nice if the British government did that for Rolls-Royce, wouldn't it? But I digress. Um, well, of course, we all know that Kia are famous for their small cars, like the, the little Pride, the Mentor, the Sportage. What about this? The new luxury limo from Kia. It obviously is designed to compete with things like the Jaguar, Mercedes, BMW. And I've got to say, it's a very, very plush, comfortable, refined car too. It's got a 3.6 litre V6 engine. It's called the Enterprise. A mm, little bit tacky, I'd say. Particularly this horrible gold here on the badge on the bonnet. But uh, it's not really the outside of this car that should interest you. It's what's going on on the inside. This is the ultimate car, and I mean the ultimate car, for the chauffeur-driven company executive, company chairman. The fact that the, the, the thing is called the Enterprise CEO, Chief Executive Officer maybe, I think that says it all. It's the sort of car that, you know, well, even Prime Ministers and Presidents might want to travel in. Now you might think that's a bit over the top because surely they'd want to travel in the style of a Mercedes or Jaguar, but it's not so much the name of this car, or the technical abilities of the car, it's the creature comforts. For example, we have here a little of what looks like just a simple armrest. Of course, your mobile phone goes in there. Got a socket there where you can plug your mobile phone in, all sorts of air conditioning controls down here. But most important of all, we've got seat adjustments here. We've got a temperature control, we've got vent control, we've got a little digital readout telling us what radio station we're listening to. We've got an on-off switch, so if your chauffeur's got something on the radio you don't like, you can actually just switch the thing off or change it. You can even watch the television from back here. As I'm sitting here, although the TV is right there in the centre console, I can see it quite clearly. But this is the best bit. This seat, apart from being fully adjustable so you can adjust the rake and all sorts of other things on the seat, actually has a built-in vibration system which gives you a back massage as you're driving along. There's also these lovely little lights up here, so if you're reading or whatever, um, on your way home from the board meeting or the government meeting, you've got everything you need. Of course, the obligatory drinks holders there for the G&T on the way home. Who needs a Rolls Royce? But, how about that? There can't be another car in the world that offers a hole in the passenger seat, the front passenger seat, where the rear seat passenger, the most important rear seat passenger, can put his feet through it's got this nice leg rest here, so you've got some sort of lumbar support. You've got your vibrating seat for your butt. And I've got to tell you, this must be the most comfortable ride in the world. No, but quite seriously, I won't pretend for a minute that this car is more stylish, has more cachet or class than something like a, a Jaguar, or a Mercedes or a BMW. But uh, you have to say, after a hard day in the boardroom or in the uh, government cabinet office, travelling home in a car like this would be just about the best experience you could imagine. There can't be another car in the world that's as luxurious as this from where I'm sitting. Excuse me, just get that. Oh, hello, Mr. Blair. Yeah, I'll be round to Downing Street in about five minutes. Yeah, put the kettle on, Tone. Yeah, cheers. Get a move on, driver. Well, that's what happens when you start up the 3.6 litre V6 engine Kia Enterprise. More like Starship Enterprise, I think. The steering wheel comes back to the normal position. Your seat comes back to the normal position. They move when you turn the engine off. They reset themselves to the proper position when you resume in the car. What happens when somebody else sits in the car is another matter, but it's clever stuff. Not particularly new or innovative because other cars have that feature, but uh, interesting it's on here, along with all sorts of other bells and whistles. Oh, here's another 
uh, interesting thing. It won't work for us now, and I don't want to try it for obvious reasons, but if you get too close to the car in front while you're parking, you'll hear a sort of beep, beep, beep sound. If you get much too close to the car in front as you're parking, you'll hear a sort of louder beep, 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 beep sound. And if you get too close to the car in front, you hear a sound. So the idea is that you take notice of the first slow, gentle beep, and you park accordingly. We've got a digital dashboard here and a digital rev counter, and I'm not crazy about those things normally. Weird though, that uh, they've got all, gone all high tech when it comes to the instrumentation. And when it comes to the little clock in the center of the dashboard, they've gone for a good old fashioned brass and tacky orange uh, sort of device that my grandmother might have on her mantelpiece. Just listen. You can't hear much, can you? That's because this car is one of the most refined cars on the market. And when I say on the market, it's, it's of course not on the market in Britain at the moment. In fact, it's probably gonna be the next generation enterprise that will go on sale here. And I personally can't wait. And I've gotta say, you know, I'm sitting here with a heated seat with radio controls here on the steering boss. I've got also heating controls here on the on the steering wheel as well. I've got my telly. CD player, no problems there, that'll come on for me if I had the volume on. Uh, AM radio, FM radio, call box up there. What else is there? We've got the uh, suspension setting here. You can have a soft ride, a hard ride. Let's turn that damn thing off. I suppose the key thing for this car is price. If it intends to come in and be the same price as a Jag or a BMW, it doesn't stand a chance because it doesn't have the cachet and quite frankly, it's not as good looking as a BMW or a Jaguar. But if they price it right, and I mean, that means substantially cheaper than a Jag or a BMW, I think they might just get away with it. The days when buying an estate car meant having to put up with a noisy, lumbering vehicle whose main concern was to carry large loads with very little comfort for the driver and passengers, thankfully, are long gone. These days, manufacturers go to great lengths to produce estate cars as good as saloons, with the added advantage of being able to open up the tailgate and throw your gear in the back. Well, for the past few years, the most desirable estate cars have been from BMW and Mercedes, the 5 Series and the E-Class estates. And these two are the latest offerings, the BMW 540 Touring and the Mercedes E430 estate, both top-of-the-range cars. So if you had the near £50,000 that both of these cars would cost to buy, where would your money go? Would it go to Bavaria or would it go to Stuttgart? Well, let me help you decide. The BMW is powered by a 4.4-litre V8 engine which produces a whopping 286 brake horsepower. It gives a 0-60 time in just over 6 seconds and a top speed limited to 155 miles per hour. And of course, in reality, the only time you're ever going to get near that, hopefully, is on the Autobahns in Germany. The Mercedes is a 4.3-litre V8, producing 279 brake horsepower, top speed of around 150 miles per hour, and 0-60, very respectable, just under 7 seconds. Fuel consumption is not quite as good as the BMW, and it also lacks that slight edge in the power department as well. The BMW has the more classy interior for me. Space-wise, it's quite adequate for both rear passengers and luggage space in the boot. And the BMW has the option of this rather smart, retractable load floor. So if you put lots of heavy items into your car, this is a great idea. The true load carrier is by far the Mercedes. It's positively huge in the back, far bigger than the 5 Series offers. You can also make it a true seven-seater with the extra bench seat which folds up and down very easily. And there's also more space for rear seat passengers, although the seats are rather firm for my liking. So what about equipment? Well, the Mercedes has everything you would expect. It has air conditioning, leather, wood, a CD player and the like. And that's perhaps what lets the Mercedes down. They don't seem keen to go down the route of having lots of gadgets. This car is very typically Mercedes, unlike the BMW, which is absolutely packed full of gadgets, as you'll see in a moment. Perhaps Mercedes feel that their customers don't want TV screens, satellite navigation and the like. So let's go and take a look at the BMW, which really is a 21st century car. 
Now, I must point out that this 540 Touring, despite its £45,000 price tag, does not come as standard with the gadgets I'm about to show you. Firstly, the TV screen acts as a menu for just about everything, the speed control, fuel consumption range, and the controls for the radio. But then you get into the really fun parts, things like the satellite navigation, the television with teletext, and the controls for a GSM mobile phone. I did try out satellite navigation yesterday on a quick route, and it worked very well and was very easy and quick to use. The television with teletext, again, you can only use the television, see the television when the car is stationary, and you have the gear selector in park but it does work very well you can tune into your favorite tv programs catch up with the latest news and sport on teletext now as i mentioned before the gadgets on this 540 touring are extras and they mount up to a whopping nine thousand pounds on top of forty five thousand pounds so it's an awful lot of money but the most important thing with a car like this is how it drives so let's see shall we The BMW comes with a choice of manual or automatic gearbox. The manual is six-speed and the automatic is BMW's Steptronic box. What's Steptronic? Well, it's basically a semi-automatic gearbox. You can drive with the box in D, then simply flick it over and you're in sport mode and change up and down manually and it really works very well and personally I love it, it's excellent. There really is a fantastic amount of power in the BMW and even when you're pushing it hard fuel consumption is still good for what is a big engine and a V8 at that. The steering perhaps for me is a little light and vague at times and you can't throw the car around like you would a sports car. The ride though is what you'd expect from a BMW, it's soft, it's supple and the suspension is excellent. So, how does the Mercedes drive on the road? Well, the suspension is firm rather than soft, and it doesn't quite involve you enough in the way that the car drives. Steering, again, is a little light and vague at times, but there's plenty of power there. This really is a car that's ideal for cruising on the motorway at speed, and if you can get it up on the Autobahn, all the better. Now, you also have the choice of an automatic gearbox on the Mercedes. There's no manual option and there's certainly no semi-automatic version like on the BMW. And that really is a big disappointment on a car like this. Mercedes for some reason seem reluctant to go down the route of introducing a semi-automatic gearbox and that really is a great shame. One item which I really miss on both the new 5 Series and the E-Class, which we found on both of the previous models, are the centre armrests. As I say, it is only a small thing and it's a silly little thing, but I used to find them both incredibly useful. The BMW used to have two armrests on either of the front seats, and the Mercedes E-Class, the old model, used to have a great big thing in the middle there, which was really comfortable and really useful. Both of the cars these days prefer to go for these cubby box come armrests, which are really no good as armrests and aren't particularly useful. So, final impressions on the Mercedes 430 and the BMW 540. Well, they're both very fine cars. If you're in the market for an Executive Express, these two cars should be on your shopping list. They're safe, they're powerful, and they're very fast. And they offer ample room for the family, for the luggage, and the pets. So, decision time. Where would my £50,000 go? Well, the Mercedes, as I say, is a very fine car. If you need true carrying capacity, the Mercedes would be your choice but I veer towards the BMW for its style, for its panache, and it's fun to drive. So just about my choice, the BMW 540 Touring. So I'm off to see my bank manager to see if I can arrange a second mortgage to buy one of these. Processing technology that Chrysler and its suppliers are developing could revolutionize the way the company makes cars and trucks. The Composite Concept Vehicle, or CCV, explores a unique automotive application of injection molding technology using the same material as found in soft drink bottles. Well, the, the, the material we use, we call it PET. Uh, it's fundamentally, it's the same pop bottles you buy at the store and then we reformulate it to some degree and we add gla chopped glass to it for structure. Well, it takes about, if you had a two liter bottle, it takes about 2,000 bottles to make this main body. When Bob Letts says, you know, why can't you make a, a car like to make toys? 
we sat down with our suppliers and we said, here's what we want to do. Uh, some of them thought we were crazy, but after we sorted through some of the suppliers, they came to the party and said, yeah, I think that's a stretch goal, but we want to be with you. The CCV is a 50 mile per gallon, nearly 100% recyclable car. It incorporates durability and extra ground clearance required for most undeveloped roads and would be priced between a motorcycle and traditional entry-level car or truck at about £4,000. The five-passenger concept car fulfills its mission of efficiency, affordability and utility through an easy-to-assemble, manufacturing-driven design and the industry's most advanced form of thermoplastic injection moulding. The number of pieces required to produce the vehicle is cut by 75 percent, 4,000 in the conventional car to about 1,100 for the CCV. The body consists of only four large composite sections which are literally fit and bonded together. It's the first all-injection molded car where the only use of steel is in the frame chassis. Those four pieces are the minimum number that you can make and still get structural strength by bonding the two together and making the, the, the two halves uh, come together. So it's a, a really the minimum number of pieces that could be conceived of in making a body. The use of resins similar to those used for disposable drink bottles makes the CCV's body structure nearly 100% recyclable, easily repairable, structurally sound and durable enough for any environment. The process permits fast start-up in developing nations and drastically reduces tooling and manufacturing plant space requirements. It's all a great idea, but there are still plenty of problems to be ironed out. Next week on Motor Week, Mike Rutherford drives a Chrysler CZV. Now let's catch up with the Frontier World Challenge team, who were to set a new Guinness World Record for driving around the globe. The Vauxhall Frontier had to cross four continents and 16 countries during this record attempt. Under Guinness rules, the team had to visit two points on opposite sides of the globe, cover more than 18,000 miles of driving and not backtrack. The clock would stop ticking during sea or air crossings and of course any traffic infringement or speeding fine would have meant instant disqualification. The has performed excellent on the, uh, the, the two legs that we've just done. Uh, we've carried out routine maintenance, changing the oil and the filters, just giving the car a general look over, and it's in perfect condition.
Finally, the team crossed the meridian line at the old Royal Observatory in Greenwich, South London, to set a new Guinness World Record for driving around the globe. The three-man team completed 18,344 miles of driving around the world in 21 days, 2 hours and 40 minutes, driving a standard Vauxhall Frontera equipped with a long-range fuel tank and safety equipment, originally aiming to cover the route in 28 days. The record now is a more pure driving record than when I did it in 1980. Dri 1980 it was more getting around the world faster than anyone. This one here, I think that the, the operative word is driving, and, and we've driven hard, and uh, with thankfulness to Colin and, and Graham and all the support of people, lots of people we've never even seen before. This car's excellent. You can see it. It's, apart from the little dent that we had with the kangaroo, um, I've just carried out routine servicing. Um, and there's been nothing else to do. Well, I think it's a, tr it's a thing that Britain uh, as a country can be very pleased about. I mean, the car was built here by Br British workforce. Two out of the three drivers were British, and we're very happy to celebrate it with Canada, of course, uh, Gary being, from, uh, being a Canadian. I have to tell you, this is without a doubt one of the most exciting days of my career. Um, when you think about three men in the Frontera, 18,346 miles, all of the climatic terrain that they went through and still came out smiling and the vehicle came through that barrier, this has been one of my most exciting days. The Swedes have swept all before them at the Prince Michael Road Safety Awards. Volvo won the Motor Industry Safety Award for 13 protective features on the S40 and V40. Saab won the Technology Award for its reactive head restraint. Meanwhile, Saab UK have told us that the 9.5 launched in October has been a runaway sales success. 2,300 cars have been ordered, 800 cars delivered so far, and 1,500 customers are to collect their cars in the next few months. Jaguar sales worldwide are up 12% over last year. The 40,000 total output split surprisingly evenly between the saloon and sports models. There were 13,000 XK8 coupes, found homes, and around 26,000 saloons. Until the end of January, Citra are offering 12 months free insurance to over 25s on the Saxo VTS. This will save young drivers a lot and open the door to the fastest accelerating hatch in its class. But please drive responsibly though. Next week we have a Mike Rutherford special as he takes us around the world on various automotive stories. And then of course we'll be reporting from the Detroit show, including the unveiling of the long-awaited VW Beetle.